Thank you all. Thank you all, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, if, if we could please take our seats. Um, please feel free to continue eating uh, because we cut into your lunch time. There's also uh, desserts out there if you want to grab them at any time. Help yourself. Um, I think we're ready to start. Um, I, I'm delighted uh, that we have uh, today uh, to brief us on uh, their perspective on the U.S.-Pakistan relationship. Pakistan's ambassador uh, to the United States, Jalil Abbas Jalani. Um, you have his, his brief bio uh, in front of you. He has served in many important capitals of the world. For Pakistan, uh, that also includes uh, New Delhi, although uh, I think he had a, an interesting uh, end to his tenure in New Delhi many years ago. Uh, but since then, things have, have uh, gone extremely well for him. Um, and f uh, for his sins, uh, Dan Feldman is now the U.S. Special <laughs> Representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan. I say this because he is the veteran on that team, having served uh, right from 2009 with Ambassador Holbrook and then with Jim Dobbins and Mark Grossman. And, uh, and now, of course, he is uh, the Special Representative. And uh, so soon after having come back from a very hectic period of negotiation in Kabul, uh, after which he should have really been given some time off. But <laughs> I'm personally grateful, Dan, that you took the time to spend with us because we need to, to hear your perspective. So um, uh, the group uh, is, is, is a track two group. And so we were off the record this morning, not for attribution. And this is now on the record it's being filmed, so everybody has a chance to continue to uh, express their views uh, on what you and Ambassador Jelani will be saying. Um, and uh, Jim Dobbins is going to be uh, the moderator. I will uh, hand over to him uh, to, to begin uh, the discussion and set the scene, and uh, then um, invite the two of you to speak, after which we will open it up to questions. Jim, thank you for, for coming. My pleasure. I, uh, I really have nothing you, to add if you, to, uh, to your introductions. So why don't we go directly to the speakers? Thank you. Good. Me, why don't you? Sir. Well, thank you, um, Suja, and to, the, and to the Atlantic Council for organizing this conference. It's um, really nice and a welcome surprise to see so many uh, friendly faces in this audience. Um, new and old, it feels like a Pakistani version of this is your life as I look around, or a, or a version of this is your Pakistani life, maybe, I don't know. Um, but um, but I particularly want to thank uh, my predecessors and my former bosses, Jim and Mark, um, and greatly appreciate their continuing support and, and friendship, and very, very glad to share uh, the stage with Ambassador Jelani, whom uh, we've worked with closely for many years now. and. Uh, I know he's looking forward to fielding all the very hardest questions that you have, so uh, so thanks. Um, and most of all, uh, Shuja, thanks for your really tireless efforts. Uh, when I did start working this account uh, in 2009 for uh, Ambassador Holbrook, um, Shuja already seemed like an institution uh, unto himself in U.S.-Pakistan relations. We're all looking forward um, to seeing your next book. Uh, and we all hope to uh, keep hearing uh, your advice and insight and whatever you opt to do in the future. Um, when Secretary Kerry asked if I would succeed Jim as a special representative, uh, I knew this transition would not be easy. For over a year, uh, as Jim can attest to more than anybody, uh, we had been working to support the Afghan political transition, uh, which has now reached a peaceful conclusion uh, with the election and inauguration of, of President Ghani and with uh, Chief Executive Officer Abdullah. Um, and it's no secret that for the past decade, the American approach to the, re to the region has been uh, filtered through the lens of our mission in Afghanistan. Uh, so that mission, uh, in both human and material and financial terms, really drove the focus. 
Um, and no relationship probably has been more affected in that than Pakistan. Uh, arguably, it, it benefited from some increased political attention, some increased uh, access to resources since the beginning uh, of the effort in Afghanistan in uh, 2001, over $13 billion uh, in coalition support funds. Reimbursements has, has gone to Pakistan, about uh, $8 billion in civilian assistance, roughly half of that, uh, maybe $4 billion. Um, uh, has been delivered since the beginning of Kerry Lugar Berman in 2009, and we've got um, at least another billion or more um, uh, in the pipeline and, and, uh, and ready to be appropriated. Uh, but obviously, Pakistan has also suffered dramatically during the same period. And uh, Prime Minister Sharif said this, I thought, quite poignantly uh, before the General Assembly just a week or two ago, noting uh, over 50,000 uh, Pakistani lives lost as a result of terrorism. Uh, a discussion that I remember having uh, very well and very frequently with former foreign minister, finance minister, and, and, and others about uh, the Pakistani costs. And um, those have not been just uh, human uh, and, uh, and financial and security, but also Pakistan's economy suffering dramatically, um, growth prospects fallen, uh, and in recent times, inward investment and exports have declined as security concerns have compounded the energy deficit. So it's easy to be overwhelmed by negative headlines, but, but also some reasons uh, to be optimistic at this particular uh, moment in time. Uh, a democratic government uh, obviously completed its constitutional term for the first time in history and was succeeded through a peaceful democratic process. There are some signs of economic progress. Pakistani uh, consumers, as I was reminded by, um, by Finance Minister Dar a few days ago when we saw him here, can now access uh, 3G, 4G wireless spectrum for the first time. Uh, I know uh, one of the, the facts, the factoids that, that was particularly popular uh, in our government was that Pakistan outcompeted China and others for the contract to produce all the Adidas soccer balls used for last summer's World Cup in Brazil. Um, and the question, I think, for this group and for our future inquiry is whether um, the trend lines of the U.S.-Pakistan relationship can outpace the headlines. So. Um, I wanted to say just a kind of a few words on, on several particular aspects of this. First is uh, a word on the North Wazirstan operations and counterterrorism efforts. Um, this operation has obviously been planned for several years, uh, and now that it's uh, finally been launched, I think it's worth reflecting on what the accomplishments have been thus far. Uh, I know that many in Pakistan have been surprised uh, by what they discovered in Miram Shah and Mir Ali, networks of tunnels, IED factories, heavy munitions. Um, and these discoveries underscore the risks of allowing safe havens to exist on either side of the Afghanistan-Pakistan border. Okay. Um, the operations clearly disrupted militant activities, um, but I think we can also all agree that the job is not done. Militant groups, uh, including both the Pakistan Taliban and the Haqqani network, continue to pose a threat to Pakistan, to Pakistan's neighbors, uh, and to the U.S. And it's vital that these operations continue and that every effort is made to prevent the safe havens from being reconstituted and not just disrupted. But our strategic interest extends well beyond the Haqqani network or any particular group. Um, it's the ungoverned vacuum uh, that is allowed uh, that which poses a multitude of threats, both militant and criminal, which threatens Pakistan, which threatens the region, including Afghanistan, India, China, uh, and then the broader world, Europe and the U.S. And eliminating these safe havens is not just about eliminating one group or one leader. It's a job that requires continued vigilance, and it's an area where we need continued cooperation between civilian government and the military, given their own shared interests. While the military can clear a region, civilian administration is required to establish rule of law, extend the writ of government, and provide aid to IDPs, providing that the enduring solution uh, is achieved that closes the space for militancy. And it's in Pakistan, uh, and it's Pakistanis that have the clearest stake in this fight, uh, as it's the Pakistani people that have borne the brunt of terrorism. Uh, the events of the past few months obviously bear this out, including uh, the incidents at the Karachi airport, the Pakistani Navy facility in Karachi, and it reveals uh, the depth of the threat and the serious risks of allowing space for violent extremism to find space to operate. We've all appreciated the vocal leadership uh, of many senior Pakistanis, certainly uh, Prime Minister Sharif and Chief of Army Staff uh, Raheel Sharif in this regard, um, and our ability uh, 
to improve the bilateral relationship, to build on the progress of the last few years, is dependent on Pakistan's continuing efforts to eliminate the safe havens from which militants in Pakistan plan and execute attacks not just on Pakistanis, but also on U.S., Afghan, and other personnel and facilities, uh, whether in Afghanistan and around the world. We have made good progress uh, in our counterterrorism cooperation, particularly since the very dark days of 2011 and 2012 in our bilateral relationship. Uh, and I point in particular to our joint counter IED efforts at this point, which have really significantly expanded. Um, uh, and again, be, in part because it's Pakistan's own direct action to interdict and disrupt IED networks. Um, more can certainly be done to ensure that these networks are fully destroyed. Uh, but we have come a long way in terms of our cooperation on this. Um, second, let me say a word about relations between Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, because as Shuja notes, um, I've spent over the last two or three months um, dozens and dozens of hours with, uh, with President Ghani, with Dr. Abdullah, uh, with their respective teams. I was um, effectively resident in Kabul uh, for uh, much of August and September. Um, but I am confident, uh, after all those conversations, that there is real serious, realistic, um, discrete uh, potential for progress uh, in relations between the two countries, given this new window of opportunity uh, with a new government in Afghanistan. Um, an early hint into what's possible happened um, just this past weekend. Ambassador Jelani and I were each happy to join um, Pakistani Finance Minister Dar, um, uh, former minister, now National Economic Advisor Zaki Wall, Dr. Kim, the president of the World Bank, uh, at an event to commemorate agreement between uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan on the transit tariff for electricity sold in the cost of 1,000 transmission lines. This is the proof of concept project for regional connectivity, some, something that certainly Mark uh, was very, very engaged on during his years uh, as SRAP. It was a negotiation well over uh, a decade in the making, um, and one that we've really uh, driven over the last few months in particular. Uh, but it is telling that um, not only did Finance Minister Dar come uh, prepared to reach resolution, but it was one of President Ghani's first acts in office uh, to instruct his staff to break the impasse and come up with a resolution here. Um, and there are other areas of potential here in, in the, in the Afghanistan-Pakistan uh, relationship. President Ghani and Dr. Abdullah each agreed, uh, both indiv indiv individually uh, and together, that a renewed effort um, at reconciliation is important, uh, which they envision a, a key role for Pakistan in that effort. Um, and they each desire uh, improved military-to-military -to -military cooperation to manage the border uh, as a key priority to reduce tensions and eliminate the safe havens uh, on both sides of the border. And so whether it's on the security um, uh, relationship, on the economic and trade relationship, um, uh, on the whole range of other issues and through multiple channels, I think that there is an alignment of interest here between Afghanistan and Pakistan, which we have not had for, for, for quite a while, uh, and we need to take advantage of it. Um, briefly, on the relationship between India and Pakistan, uh, I don't need to tell anyone in this room that there's no relationship more critical to Pakistan's future than its relationship with its neighbor. Um, and I'm convinced that India's uh, rise in prosperity and global <coughs> leadership cannot be fully realized uh, until it has a better relationship with Pakistan. So we're obviously extremely concerned um, by reports of violence over the last few weeks along the line of control and the working boundary. Um, I've personally uh, raised these concerns with each side, as have many others in our administration just in the last um, uh, week or two, uh, and urge them to engage uh, in dialogue to reduce tensions and end the violence. Um, and then let me lastly just say a word about the future relationship between um, U.S. and Pakistan as a lead-in for Ambassador Jelani. Uh, this is a relationship um, that I'm proud uh, has grown significantly over the last five years. Uh, it certainly had its uh, volatility and, and, and difficulties, but over the continuum, um, it's grown, and it's obviously something that we are committed uh, to deepening and evolving uh, so that we're, we're both best enabled to face the challenges of the 21st century. The Kerry Luger Berman uh, authorization, which just expired on September 30th, at least the, the, the five-year specific authorization of KLB, uh, spelled out a set of policy principles that continue, though, to guide 
uh, our relationship from support for civilian democratic institutions, parity in assistance to civilian and military entities, expanded economic cooperation, and expanded people-to-people -people ties. Um, those uh, principles remain certainly as important today as they were in 2007 when um, then Senator Biden reminded me at uh, the UNGA a week ago that uh, it was his legislation um, with Senator Luger which was first introduced um, and certainly in 2009 when it was signed into law. Um, but to take that next step, we will need a common conception of what this relationship can achieve. And it can't be solely about uh, Afghanistan or about terrorism or about India or about China. Um, it can't just be um, the sum of negative parts. We have to, uh, as we get this, continue to work to get the U.S.-Pakistan relationship right. Um, it's critical <clears throat> as we seek to manage many of the most difficult aspects of the 21st century from um, nonproliferation, uh, certainly ongoing counterterrorism issues, um, uh, climate change, uh, ensuring peace and stability in the region. Um, and so for the U.S.-Pakistan relationship, I think, to grow, it's going to be um, less about what our two governments can do and more and more about what our peoples and our businesses uh, and others have to offer each other. And growing the space in this relationship um, is a challenge that those uh, both inside the government but increasingly importantly outside the government uh, can help to advance. Um, on the economic side, uh, we've obviously sought to move um, away from just um, one-way assistance-based uh, dependent conversation to a more trade-based one. And America is already Pakistan's largest bilateral trading partner, export destination, and source of foreign investment. There is no silver bullet um, to growing our economic relationship. Expanding trade and investment uh, will mean improving Pakistan's competitiveness. So a free trade agreement, even in the best case scenario, won't make that happen by itself. Uh, nor will any other action on the part of the U.S. government because Pakistan's competitiveness is ultimately up to Pakistanis. Um, certainly one of the things that I am proudest of in the course of the last five years in helping to oversee Kerry Luger Berman um, is how far we've come in redefining and focusing uh, the economic piece of it. And so um, I, I think that it's important to recognize that we have helped to accomplish really tremendous things with Kerry Luger Berman over the course um, of, uh, of the last five years, uh, which have made really a kind of demonstrable difference in Pakistani lives, including by being able to respond to urgent crises as with the, the, as with the floods in 2010. Um, but it, we've also uh, made real demonstrable progress, and I, and I continually hear um, former foreign ministers, former finance ministers, voice in my ear as, I, as we embark on these issues um, on focusing our efforts, on doing things more aligned with uh, Pakistani priorities, um, and doing fewer and fewer uh, issues, but on a, on a better and more effective scale, bigger and more effective scale. And um, we didn't necessarily go as far as we hoped we could go, um, but, we, uh, but we came a long way. And I'd say in particular, um, Hearing you on Daimar Basha, uh, we, the fact that we were able to culminate years' worth of work a few days ago in the Daimar Basha Investment Conference here, which is just not even, uh, you know, to be Churchillian, uh, not even uh, the beginning of the end, but perhaps the end of the, of the beginning, the first, uh, the, the fact that we've helped to continue to facilitate it and demonstrate what the opportunities are, again, primarily for the private sector. Um, and how uh, the rest of the international community can engage on an infrastructure project of such uh, importance. But I think it was a real specific example of the utility um, uh, to Pakistan of our continuing engagement uh, on this and other issues. We paid, obviously, foremost attention to energy, stabilization, economic growth. Um, the projects uh, that I think have been most significant are, uh, first and foremost, on energy, uh, not only in, in uh, what we've tried to do on Dairon Basha, including funding some of the uh, due diligence projects, but more specifically adding 1,400 megawatts to Pakistan's grid, about 7% of Pakistan's total electricity production, uh, and benefiting 16 million people or so. With a, um, uh, We're on track, I think, to have up to 2,000 megawatts um, by, the end of, uh, by the end of next year. On infrastructure, uh, we've built over 1,000 kilometers of roads. Uh, but again, it's, it's more targeted. And not only does this help to 
expand the writ of government into some of the tribal areas, um, but it's included repairing all four uh, connection uh, access roads, the connections between Afghanistan and Pakistan. So the importance uh, for trade and commerce uh, is also very significant. And I think um, most creatively, we've launched three private equity funds through the Pakistan Private Investment Initiative, uh, which will invest over $150 million in small and medium-sized uh, enterprises in Pakistan. And as these funds begin reaching financial close, um, we'll start seeing the fruits of this uh, quite soon as well, making their first investments by the end of the year. Um, and then lastly, I think an underreported story um, is what Care Legal Berman has helped to do for people-to-people -people ties. Uh, over the past five years, Pakistan has been the largest recipient of U.S. government-funded exchanges um, anywhere in the world. Over 1,300 Pakistani students come uh, each year to the U.S. for their education, including 200 under the Fulbright program, uh, with an alumni network now of uh, 14,000 students who have benefited from this. So uh, we've got very creative entrepreneurial uh, partnership, 17 now, between U.S. and Pakistani universities, um, and a prospect to really grow these connect uh, connections with, uh, with, with more resources. Um, these are the types of exchanges that I think are investments really in the future of Pakistan and of U.S.-Pakistan relationships, uh, which will yield dividends for decades to come. But also, thus far, only the U.S. has funded these exchanges, and I hope that uh, the government of Pakistan will also consider committing some of its own resources uh, to, to do things similarly. Um, and then all of this uh, is caught under the overarching framework of the U.S. strategic, uh, the U.S.-Pakistan strategic dialogue as the centerpiece of that. Uh, re-energized and, and reinvigorated last year on Secretary Kerry's trip to Pakistan, uh, which met again earlier uh, this year. We're looking forward to convening um, the next ministerial early in 2015. Um, but more importantly are the fact that, you know, we went, um, uh, having spent the last five years uh, ensuring that this relationship, I think, is finally the most realistic, the most pragmatic. I think the perfect kind of case in point is on the strategic dialogues. We went in 2009, 2010 from a high of uh, 13 or so working groups uh, under Mark's leadership. We, uh, in 2011, 2012, uh, as the re relationship was really facing difficulties, we focused on five of the most uh, critical ones. We've just added, um, after a lot of discussion with the government, a sixth one on uh, exactly this issue on, on higher education, science and technology, people-to-people -people exchanges. Um, but the fact that the work of the relationship is still being done under these working groups and that they will all meet over the course of uh, the next few months and have been meeting frequently. Finance Minister Dar here last week for the Economic and Finance Working Group, um, the CT um, and Law Enforcement Working Group, the Nonproliferation One, the Defense Consultative Group, and obviously the Energy One. Um, so there's... Um, at a time of, I think, real potential uh, and real opportunity, uh, I want to make sure that we can leverage all that we've done to get to this point um, and, uh, and make sure that as we are now finally, I think and I hope, in a moment of alignment, uh, not only in Pakistan but with new governments uh, in Afghanistan and in India um, with, um, and with our relationship as kind of clear-eyed but also strong, uh, much more so and much more realistically, I think, than it's been uh, over the course of the last few years, that we, that we harness this and are able to, to, to move it forward. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Dan, and thank you. We're glad that you were able to visit Washington to visit here today. <laughs> we hope you'll be able to come by occasionally <laughs> over the coming months. Um, uh, Jalil? Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Shurya Nawaz. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador James Dobbins. And thank you, uh, Dan, for your wonderful remarks. I think there are going to be some repetitions because I thought that initially, I'll only say that I endorse everything that Dan <laughs> has uh, said. But uh, I am extremely grateful um, uh, to the Atlantic Council, to Mr. Shurya Nawaz, for inviting me to share my perspective on Pakistan-U.S. relations. Uh, to this distinguished gathering, uh, and this distinguished gathering also includes um, two of my former bosses, um, uh, former Foreign Minister Hina Rabani Khar and uh, Ambassador Malia Lodi, with whom 
I work very closely uh, in the last uh, uh, few years, and I have developed the highest respect and regards for both these ladies. Uh, <clears throat> as I uh, share my perspective on, on this very important relationship, I, um, I would like to highlight that the perspective that I'm going to share today is not only based on, on, uh, on my experience as the ambassador of Pakistan to Washington, D.C., but also uh, something that I have experienced dur during my previous capacity as the foreign secretary of Pakistan. And here, uh, I must acknowledge the, uh, the formidable role played by my three distinguished colleagues, uh, the three SRAPs, Ambassador uh, Mark Rossman, Ambassador James Robbins, and uh, now Ambassador Daniel Dan Feldman, who have uh, worked very, very closely with, uh, with me and with other colleagues in the government of Pakistan in building a, a sustained and a robust relationship between our two countries. Uh, Without doubt, uh, this relationship is, a, is, a, is an important, but at the same time, it's a unique relationship which has seen many highs and lows. I have witnessed the low, uh, the lowest point, as a matter of fact, in this relationship when I took over as Foreign Secretary in the beginning of 2012, and now I'm witnessing, certainly witnessing a, a, a high in this, uh, in this relationship. Uh, if um, uh, in the past we have had uh, our respective share of uh, shares of complaints, uh, if uh, but at the same time, if complaints and uh, uh, and the uh, 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 dominated the discourse one day, uh, the next day obviously there was a chorus of uh, strategic uh, uh, indispensability and close alliance between the two countries, and I have absolutely no doubt that the current phase that we are passing through is is uh, one of uh, great partnership and building uh, uh, convergences between the two countries. Uh, as I mentioned, that in the past we have had our shares uh, of complaints. Uh, perception, for instance, in the U.S. Uh, in the past about Pakistan has been of an unreliable friend. Uh, Pakistan hedging in Afghanistan, Pakistan providing safe havens in North Waziristan to elements hostile to uh, U.S. and Afghanistan. Pakistan being India-centric. Uh, this is uh, something that we often heard from our uh, uh, U.S. colleagues. Uh, and Pakistan being unhelpful to uh, global non-proliferation uh, efforts, etc. On our part, uh, certainly uh, we have been complaining about lack of appreciation of Pakistan's uh, security concerns vis-a-vis -vis India and Afghanistan, uh, tendency uh, uh, to overlook the presence of TTP uh, in Nuristan and Kunar of Afghanistan, uh, reluctance to address Pakistan's concerns over India's Cold Star Doctrine, and also aggressive postures uh, and absence of an even-handed approach on nuclear issues. Uh, but from our point of view, I think we, uh, we have taken a determined uh, decision. We need to tr transcend the uh, past and look to the future. And this is exactly uh, what we are doing at the moment. Uh, in our view, some of the important developments which have taken place internally in Pakistan in the last several years, and also the, uh, the, uh, the evolving geo-regional uh, uh, environment, coupled with many of the challenges, the common challenges that we both face in, in our part of the world, uh, uh, the, uh, it certainly will alter the course of this relationship, uh, making it more robust, sustainable, and strategic. And I say this because uh, of a certain degree of conviction, because internally, Pakistan over the last several years has gone through a silent revolution. Um, we are a transformed country, um, and we are constantly making efforts to change for the better. Uh, democracy uh, in Pakistan, though it's a noisy democracy, but it is taking strong roots uh, in our country. Our media is ruthlessly free. Uh, its uh, courts are independent, and uh, we have an emerging uh, active civil society. There is a lot of focus on economic revival, good governance, an end to extremism on education, health, and human rights not only by the government, but also by all the political parties, media, members of the civil society. And uh, um, there is a national consensus that we have witnessed in the last several months uh, uh, to end terrorism, extremism, and to uh, rein in 
the jihadi organizations and if you look at the uh, current landscape in Pakistan, the kind of operations that we have launched in Pakistan, not only in North Waziristan, but also in, in major cities in Pakistan that would testify to what I'm saying. Uh, there is also a strong realization in Pakistan that uh, without a peaceful regional environment, uh, economic progress will not be uh, achieved. Uh, Pakistan is keen to promote uh, regional connectivity uh, in an economically integrated uh, peaceful region, and this is something that we are trying to, to work for. As a responsible nuclear state, we have taken steps to ensure full safety and security of our uh, nuclear program and assets. Uh, we uh, are witnessing a smooth and responsible transition in Afghanistan, which is, I think, is a very, very positive development. There are going to be challenges, but uh, the initial uh, 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 the, uh, the feedback that we all are getting is, uh, uh, it gives us a lot of optimism about the, uh, about the uh, future of Afghanistan. <laughs> On our part, we have done everything possible to facilitate uh, this uh, uh, peaceful transition, and we will continue to do so. Um, we, uh, there is, uh, as, as uh, uh, we have been saying all along, that uh, Pakistan, like the US in the past or earlier, the Soviet Union, we all committed mistakes uh, in order to fix Afghanistan. And I think uh, there is a realization of our mistakes in Pakistan. We have realized, and I think I could, we can come and discuss those, those, that point when we come to Afghanistan. And uh, uh, we also seek normalization of relationship with India and the resolution of all disputes uh, uh, through a dialogue process. Uh, we are, US and Pakistan are also working closely uh, in order to defeat the forces of extremism. And last, uh, only uh, uh, last month, Pakistan was one of the leading uh, supporters of the US-sponsored resolution uh, in the United uh, Nations Security Council against ISIS and other uh, foreign terrorist organizations operating in various countries. Uh, in this backdrop, backdrop uh, we believe that Pakistan is certainly better positioned uh, today to meet uh, the multiple challenges that we both face in, in that region. We have no doubt that a strong U.S.-Pakistan partnership uh, will only strengthen our ability to contribute to security and stability uh, in the region. We uh, consider uh, the United States as a vital partner uh, for, uh, for peace and stability uh, uh, in, the, in the region. Uh, today, uh, I have a, a lot of satisfaction to report that we have more uh, convergences than divergences. Uh, uh, as Secretary Kerry, I remember last year when he visited Pakistan, he said something very significant and he said, and I quote, that the big issues, the big objectives uniting the two countries were bigger than what divided the two countries. And I think he has uh, very aptly dis described this relationship. Uh, from Pakistan's perspective, uh, we feel that this relationship, in case we, we, uh, we have to build this relationship into a strong, uh, sustainable, robust relationship, then we have to build a positive narrative about each other. And this is exactly uh, we are trying to do, not only in Pakistan, but I also witnessed the same effort being made in the, uh, in the U.S. because when you go to, uh, when you uh, watch various testimonies by the administration officials uh, before the Congress, the, uh, the testimonies uh, by the senior administration officials before members of the Congress uh, these days are certainly in a much more positive uh, uh, direction. And also there is a need to identify areas of common interest at bilateral uh, regional and global plane. Uh, bilaterally, I think uh, my very able colleague, Ambassador Dan Feldman, has very rightly mentioned that the relationship are on a very positive trajectory. Uh, strategic dialogue has been revived. We have also established five working groups, uh, a working group on economy and finance, energy, counterterrorism and law enforcement, defense cooperation, security, stability, and, uh, uh, and non-proliferation. And recently, we have agreed to, uh, to establish one more, to add one more working group, which is on, 
on education, science, and technology. And I entirely agree with you that uh, we have benefited tremendously from the, uh, uh, from the uh, uh, contributions that the U.S. has made in, uh, in the education sector. We have the largest number of Fulbright scholars uh, these days studying in, in Pakistan. And I see that uh, the universities in Pakistan are also now building uh, uh, connections with the American universities. Uh, on the econom uh, economy side, uh, we have agreed to uh, uh, we have agreed on a plan of action to promote economic uh, and trade relations. Uh, we are also uh, discussing uh, uh, the enhanced market access for Pakistani products uh, in the U.S. market. Uh, cooperation on counterterrorism and law enforcement, as Dan mentioned, has resulted in enhanced capacity of our law enforcement agencies, and also reduced the uh, threat from IEDs, uh, uh, so which, which had emerged as a major threat for uh, both Pakistan and also uh, uh, Afghanistan and the ISF countries. Uh, in the energy sector, we are grateful for the support that uh, we have received from the United States. Uh, we are grateful to the U.S. for their support on DASU hydroelectric project, which was launched uh, a couple of months ago, and the, uh, the support that uh, the U.S. extended in the World Bank board that was uh, uh, crucial in, in getting a unanimous decision in support of this uh, Dasu hydroelectric project. Uh, on the 8th of this month, again, we uh, jointly arranged a, a, an excellent conference on the Amir Bhasha Dam which was participated by around 120 uh, members from the uh, uh, important members of the business community, the U.S. business community, besides officials from the USAID, state, and uh, World Bank, IMF, and other uh, departments. Uh, defense cooperation has uh, also improved, uh, the, uh, uh, and so has the uh, intelligence cooperation. And I see uh, uh, on a daily basis that the trust between the, uh, be be between the defense authorities of the two countries and also uh, the trust at the intelligence-to-intelligence -intelligence level has also uh, improved uh, significantly in the last several months. Uh, we have uh, developed broad convergences on majority of the strategic issues. We fully support the US, U.S. initiative on nuclear security. We are, working on nucle uh, we are working closely in ensuring the safety and security of Pakistan's strategic assets. The U.S. highly appreciates Pakistan's command and control structure, and we are party to uh, the, the Chemical uh, Weapons Convention as well as the Bi Bi Biological Weapons Con Convention. Uh, we are committed to a universal moratorium on nuclear testing, and we are keen to promote strategic stability in South Asia and remain ready to carry forward the process of CBMs with India, which have unfortunately been disrupted for the last several uh, months. In the next couple of weeks, uh, uh, a number of meetings are planned between uh, uh, Under Secretary Rose Guatemala and our uh, Foreign Secretary and other officials of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and uh, the SPD. And I think that uh, these meetings will further develop a much better understanding between, uh, between the experts and the officials from both the sides. Uh, the, uh, at the regional level, we have uh, shared interest in peace and stability in South Asia. Uh, peace and stability in Afghanistan is certainly a matter of great importance for us. Uh, in order to advance our shared objectives of peace and stability in, in Afghanistan, our cooperation has improved significantly. Due to our joint efforts, we have been able to ensure security during the recently held Afghan elections. Uh, since our common challenges in Afghanistan are likely to intensify in the coming months and year, years, um, our cooperation and coordination has also improved, and is li it would certainly be improved in the, in the months to come. Uh, North Waziristan was certainly a, uh, a, a kind of had emerged as a major talking points in the last several years. Um, our mi military operations that we have launched in Waziristan will certainly help allay concerns related to safe havens and also help stabilize Afghanistan. And we have absolutely no doubt 
that these operations that we have launched will also will have a positive effect uh, in, uh, uh, on the operations that we are conducting against other jihadi, jihadi elements inside Pakistan. Uh, at the same time, uh, certainly there is an expectation from Pakistan that a matching uh, uh, efforts would be, uh, uh, would be taken inside Afghanistan to take action against uh, militants uh, in Nuristan and Kunar province of Afghanistan. Uh, uh, I, uh, we have uh, uh, taken a determined decision that we will not allow Pakistan's territory to be used against any other countries, uh, including Afghanistan, and our expectation is exactly the same, that uh, Afghanistan's territory <coughs> should not be used either by militants or other countries to destabilize Pakistan. Uh, we are very happy that uh, the new administration in Afghanistan, they, in their first statement, uh, uh, they reaffirmed uh, uh, that they will not allow the use of Afghan territory to destabilize uh, uh, its neighbors, uh, including Pakistan. Uh, similarly, uh, we feel that security is indiv indivisible. Uh, therefore, any security arrangement that uh, is worked out by any country uh, with Afghanistan in the uh, in the days to come, must take into account the security interests of Pakistan. Uh, talking about the regional issues, we have reached out to India to reduce tension. Uh, there is a realization in Pakistan, across the board, not only in the government, but also all the political parties, that without peace in the region, we will not be able to achieve economic progress. Uh, a stable uh, region certainly uh, dis uh, would depend on addressing uh, the, uh, 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 the uh, disputes and finding uh, solutions through a sustained dialogue process. Uh, this would certainly require a solution, a lasting solution to, uh, to the uh, Jammu and Kashmir dispute, which uh, neither country can, can, can ignore. And the latest uh, 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 tension that we witness on the line of control should basically testify, would certainly reinforce this point of view. Uh, we are disappointed that India uh, uh, canceled the foreign secretary level talks, which was scheduled to take place on the 25th of August. Um, the Indian decision to call off the foreign secretary level talks certainly, in our view, has dented uh, Prime Minister Modi's image. Uh, we, uh, we are, uh, to be honest, uh, it's difficult for us to comprehend uh, the escalatory and aggressive steps that are being taken in the recent uh, weeks on the line of control and working boundary. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, overall perspective uh, that is developing uh, in, uh, in our region is that the, uh, the policies being pursued by India, they certainly run contrary to, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, counter to uh, uh, the uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi's desire to engage Pakistan in a serious dialogue process. Uh, we are being located at the crossroads of three important regions, South Asia, Central Asia, and West Asia. We can also act as a bridge uh, uh, for peace and prosperity and development in the region. And this is something that we are working uh, 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 to achieve these objectives. We are already pursuing several proposals and initiatives for regional connectivity, uh, projects such, such as China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, um, TAPI, CASA 1000, and TUTA. And here I would also uh, mention, as uh, our colleague Dan uh, mentioned, uh, that we had a wonderful agreement last week on, on the uh, transit fee between Pakistan and Afghanistan, and this, is one, this was one issue which was uh, a pending issue for the last several months. And uh, uh, the very fact that India has, uh, that, that Afghanistan has reduced the price uh, from the earlier price being, uh, 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 being demanded by them from 2.5 to 1.25 also reflects a a kind of a positive uh, 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 kind of a, uh, 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 a, an attitude by the new Afghanistan government, a pragmatic approach by them to, uh, uh, to uh, move forward on a, a regional connectivity and economic uh, issues between 
Pakistan and also in the region. Uh, at the global level, I think uh, it's important to recall that during the uh, Cold War, uh, Pakistan played a pivotal role in facilitating a rapprochement between China and the U.S. Uh, this was in line with our objectives that Pakistan's relations with these two important countries would be beneficial for international peace and stability. Uh, this continues to be our belief. Uh, you know, Pakistan enjoys good relations with the uh, Islamic world. Pakistan enjoys very good relations with Iran. Uh, and I uh, say it with a degree of pride that I represent not only the interests of Pakistan, but I also represent the interests of Iran in this country. And I see, I witness that uh, there is significantly uh, an improvement in, in, that, uh, uh, in that area as well. Uh, and we can certainly play uh, a, a useful role in the maintenance of uh, uh, peace and stability in the region. Um, uh, uh, playing such a role certainly is, uh, is important for us because any, any co confrontation uh, uh, between the U.S. and Iran, or for that matter, uh, U.S. and, uh, uh, or any misunderstanding between U.S. and China could have uh, negative consequences uh, for, for, the, for the region. We are glad that Pakistan has a robust cooperation at uh, multilateral level between the U.S. and uh, Pakistan. As uh, I, I mentioned uh, uh, a while ago that uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, resolution in the Security Council, which was an important resolution, was uh, Pakistan played a re leading role in developing a consensus on that uh, resolution. To conclude, uh, I think uh, sustaining the project, uh, this positive trajectory is of uh, <coughs> paramount importance. From our point of view, this would certainly uh, require uh, building trust, uh, which is certainly improving, but uh, we need to work uh, uh, more closely in order to, 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 uh, to develop a high degree of uh, trust and confidence between our two countries. Expansion of trade, investment, and economic cooperation uh, we need to respect each other's comfort level and also uh, 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 appreciation of Pakistan's security concerns is something that would be of, uh, of paramount importance. And I thank you. Thank you, um, Ambassador Jelani and uh, Ambassador Feldman. Um, we have a few minutes. If uh, there are any questions or comments, we'd uh, gladly take those. Uh, Ambassador Munta. Very briefly, I, I'm delighted that you're both talking about a trajectory that's going up since my trajectory was entirely going down <laughs> when I was with you. I don't believe in causality that as soon as I left it began to go back up, but there seems to be some element there. But what I wanted to ask you, Dan, and, and to a lesser extent, uh, Mr. Ambassador, is do you see the, su the sustaining of a trajectory as adequate policy, or do you think that with the changes that are going on in Afghanistan, it's time for a break? with some of the things that we've done, that is to pocket the benefits that we might have from a sustained trajectory and to say perhaps it's time to change things, whether it's a bureaucratic change in the structure of how we deal with uh, Pakistan at the State Department or throughout the bureaucracy, or whether there are initiatives that we want to do that, are, that not only build on this sustainment, but break with the past. Um. Causation is not necessarily great to correlation, uh, but uh, I will leave, I'll leave it at that. Um, I, you know, in terms of the, there seems to be a, a remarkable degree of interest in terms of just the um, governmental organization of, of, of this issue. Uh, you know, this was, in terms of our office, this was an effort that um, Secretary Clinton um, uh, put together with, uh, with Ambassador Holbrook at the, at the time. It was actually meant to ensure that um, more attention, more resources, um, uh, more ability to engage the interagency uh, could be marshaled for these issues. And um, when the right time comes to, uh, to disband it, and, and uh, uh, it was always meant to be experimental um, in nature and not a permanent structure, um, it, will be, uh, it will be disbanded. I think certainly one of those uh, potential uh, it's always re-examined as, as each of the special representatives leave, and certainly the decision at the time that Jim left was that given how 
uh, how many issues remained. Um, and given the importance, I think even now more than ever, of marshaling resources, given all the other global crises uh, that are confronting Congress, that are confronting um, our stakeholders, uh, the fact that this actually helps to ensure that it gets a, a, you know, a disproportionate share uh, of, of, of the attention and resources. So um, when that's no longer necessary, you know, the, the office will look more like a, a typical office. But for now, I think it's in, it's in the benefit of uh, uh, of, uh, of, of the U.S. Pakistan bilateral relationship. I, I, I think in terms of what can be done in the future, um, success breeds success. And, and uh, I think particularly for Congress, uh, and I mean, certainly some of my colleagues who are working there can, can speak more to this, but the more that's demonstrated that both countries are getting something out of this relationship, and certainly Congress sees this very disproportionately through counterterrorism, counterextremism, uh, as especially with the drawdown uh, in, in Afghanistan. But the more we can demonstrate that there has been real progress here, the more ability there will be, um, and the fewer kind of, of the irritants uh, uh, that we have, which have um, really taken uh, far too much kind of uh, time and attention from the relationship, the core part of the relationship over the last few years. Um, the more that we can build on the successes that we've had and the, and, and the more cooperation there will be. I mean, on something, if we're, as, as we're moving to a kind of more trade-based relationship, there would be far more receptivity to increase trade, whether in any form, whether that's ultimately an FTA or any of the many steps uh, that we have to, to, to move there, if we can demonstrate that we're continuing to um, both get what we need out of this relationship. At, at this point, we can say that in, in many aspects of it, but the more we can say that and the more credibly and legitimately we can say that, the more that we can achieve some of these successes. Well, um, but as far as Pakistan is uh, concerned, certainly change is, uh, transformation is already taken place, and also I think things are certainly getting better at the bureaucratic level. I think that today we are witnessing more coordination between various arms of the government, and uh, one of the very important decisions that was taken by the government was the establishment of this Cabinet Committee on National Security. Uh, which, uh, which, which, where the decisions are taken by uh, through a process of consultations and consensus, and there are many examples that would testify uh, uh, the statement that I am making, and also at the bureaucratic level, uh, gone are the days when the same uh, brief and talking points, which were prepared by the uh, by uh, us babus in the ministries, would be. Uh, uh, would be adhered to by the by the uh, uh, by the leadership. I remember that uh, um, 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 Foreign Minister uh, uh, Hina Rabani Khan uh, on many occasions would uh, completely put our uh, talking points aside and uh, you know would prepare her own talking points and which would put. And to give you one more example, uh, recently um, after. Uh, our Prime Minister's visit to India uh, to participate in the inauguration of Prime Minister Modi, uh, I think it was a very positive gesture on the part of uh, uh, the Prime Minister. But as the Prime Minister was coming back, uh, there was a statement by, uh, the, uh, by uh, the Indian Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, External Affairs, which was not very positive. And the, uh, obviously, there is always a tendency on the part of the bureaucracies to respond to uh, these statements. Uh, and we, don't, we never lose any time to respond to, these, to such statements. And that, will, that used to be the case in the past. But this time around, we were given specific direction by the leadership that we need, we need not uh, respond to this negative statement. That, that has come from the, so that's the kind of change that we are taking place. And I think this is something which is, uh, the, the political leadership is uh, taking uh, control of the situation, which is, I think, again, a very positive development which is uh, taking place in the country. Thank you. Uh, we have three questions uh, in a row, Tariq Ghazi, Asif Yaseen Malik, and then Ishrat Hussain. <coughs> There is no collusion as far as this. <laughs> <laughs> um, as is to be expected and normal, I think, for representatives of the government to say that all is well under the sun. Um, I think uh, we must question 
the fact that if this is really the case, it's, it's good to hear that. It's very satisfying. Um, but I think it is uh, necessary to also then try and work beyond that and say if that was the case, how has it changed the perceptions, both <coughs> publicly, privately, in the administration? Uh, I don't see a groundswell of change in terms of public opinions in either country. I don't see that groundswell of change in the opinions of the think tanks or the intellectuals or the people who write. I don't see that uh, in, the, uh, in the private discussions that the administration has. Um, I think it is necessary for us to perhaps look at uh, other than these convergences, what really puts us on a collision course. And if the Pakistan-U.S. relationship is defined in negative terms rather than in positive terms, prevent Pakistan from failing, prevent Pakistan from becoming a, a proliferation state, prevent Pakistan from, you know, aiding terror, it's a negative connotation. The moment that thing stops, the relationship stops. Now, what is the positivity in terms of our relationship? How do you take it forward? I think that is what uh, uh, is something that we would like to hear. Now, we've heard here, elsewhere as well, that uh, there is a Pakistani fatigue that sets in in U.S. thinking, whether it is at the administration level, at the level of the Congress, wherever where you think that it's about time that you forgot about Pakistan and, and dealt with other issues. Um, I've also heard people saying to me that Pakistan needs to give the administration officials some more maneuver space. That space, they point out, is very limited, within which they can pursue the Pakistani case in the Congress or elsewhere. <clears throat> and you need to do something. Give us a little more space so that we can plead your case. And I find it very strange that even the, the CSF funds, you know, the coalition support funds, are tied down to Pakistan giving a certification on the medical health of a criminal, Shaquille Afridi. Uh, now, the point is, you want to help us fight extremism or not? If Pakistan has come to that conclusion too late, that's our mistake, certainly. But it has come to that point where it is willing to commit itself to fighting extremism and eliminating militancy. Now, if that is also your common objective, and you have the means and the tools to give to us and to share the necessary expertise and the intelligence for it, what prevents you from doing that? If you're obsessed with the fact that it will upset India, and therefore your engagement with India denotes how your policies to Pakistan will play out, even in those areas where there is this very, very strong convergence, I think you must also understand that that engagement with India encourages it to be arrogant in its dealing with Pakistan. And in the same way, if you're looking at, you know, stabilization in Afghanistan, you will not help stabilization in Afghanistan by not helping Pakistan fight terror. And at the same time, you will not help Pakistan or the region if you do not censure and put pressure and stop the Middle Eastern monarchies from funding all these extremists who come and fight in our countries. So there is a, a linkage that I think the administration must recognize on both sides, and they must focus on those areas that will enable Pakistan actually to become stable. Because if it is not stable, uh, you, you look at that, the negative connotation from it, which is that a failing Pakistan will suck you in far more rapidly than you can uh, imagine. Thank you. Let's take, let's take all the three together. My first uh, observation is about the trajectory part of the Pak-U.S. relations. 
Yes, it was on an upward trajectory post Salala and uh, till probably recently. But I think that, uh, that trajectory is now flattened, almost flattened. And if we can recollect Peter's uh, talk here, that would corroborate my statement. Uh, and when we say it is flattened, uh, we should not you know, see the recent happenings. The results are still to come. And let us not compare it to the last two years. If we look at it in the last 20 years, then we will find out that it is flattened. Uh, by a daily analysis, I think that's an uh, inappropriate analysis. The trajectory is now almost flat. A uh, couple of uh, engagements here and there really do not matter. Uh, the issue in Pakistan, uh, to my mind, is the capacity to absorb what the US offers to Pakistan. This has been a major issue for Pakistan, which has not been addressed, and I think uh, the U.S. is party to the, uh, to the uh, you know, to the detriment to our capacity building by providing external capacity, and an external capacity which is not uh, uh, aware of the reality in the country. And I can give you an example of uh, roads that we built in South Vizistan and now recently in North Vizistan. Since I was uh, implementing that project, uh, the USAID said, no way are we going to give this money to the uh, common construction uh, companies, etc., in FATA, and the FATA secretariat and all that. So there was a bending of rules in Washington where for the first time USAID money came directly to the Army, and we constructed uh, over 300 kilometers of roads in about $320 million within a time space of 18 months. And the uh, oversight mechanism was a multi-tiered oversight. And the US oversight, when they visited the roads, they said, we wish we could give this proje such projects in America also to your constructors. So this is how it is. Again, an example of UAE aid in the post-flood uh, in Swat. The UAE uh, government refused to give money uh, to the agencies which were working on the relief. The money came directly to GHQ and we implemented it. So there's a very serious issue of capacity building. I can challenge that if today, for a one-year project, if somebody gives $5 billion to Pakistan, it cannot spend it. So I think this is something which we have to look into it. I'll also quote the example of Fulbright Scholarship. Previously, it used to be a 50-50 uh, financing mechanism. Recently, it has been brought to 75-25, which will go negatively to the scholarship and it will start reducing the number of scholars. So I think these are the things where, where the, the foot has to be put down. There is a priority difference between Pakistan's approach and towards uh, the approach of the donors. Uh, our approaches are politically driven most of the time. I'll quote two examples. Benazir Income Support Plan. If somebody thinks giving a thousand rupees to a family would make a difference, he doesn't know the reality on ground. A billion dollars a year are being spent on that project. And we are only creating people who are stretching hands. They are beggars and a lot of corruption is involved in it. And the other project is recently launched, the bus project in Lahore and Islamabad. This project has cost a billion dollars to Pakistan. You can imagine what could have been done with those billion dollars in the education or health sector. So the, the donors, and particularly the United States, has a selective interference in the, in the prioritization of all this. It has to be across the board. Unless it is across the board, the assistance that you provide, the help that you provide, is not likely to accrue the dividends that are desired. Thank you. Thank you. I'm tempted to ask these questions because we have Mark Rossman, James Stobbins, and uh, Danny Feldman here. And my hypothesis is that if 
US administration had not created the FPAC hyphenated office, the tensions, the hostilities, the frictions between Pakistan and the United States would not have been as sharp because there is only one prism through which the entire range of relationship is being scrutinized, which is through Afghanistan. That's my hypothesis. Two of you are no longer in the government, so you can speak more frankly. I sympathize with Dan that he may not be able to speak it. So I still was very tempted to ask this question because this is my hypothesis. Okay, um, we're over time, so I'm going to ask uh, Dan and uh, I'll start with Mark and Jim. Yes. Well, let me ask you first to see if you have any comments, and then that'll give time to uh, to Mark and to Jim to respond. Thank you. <laughs> Do you want to start or you want me to? Um, on, on the general trajectory, I, I, I missed Peter's uh, presentation, so I'd be interested in kind of what, what he uh, suggests or how people interpret it that it's flattened. I, I just simply don't believe that. I mean, I think all the indicators, having lived through the volatility of this relationship over the last uh, five plus years at this point, um, it's been through kind of painstaking work that uh, that we got it back on track in 2011, 2012 with very kind of discrete, tangible goals, which, which Mark uh, initially laid out and, and Jim helped implement. Um, and, that, uh, and that as a result of the success of many of those, I think it's, um, it's on, on much uh, stronger footing. And I think that it continues to uh, be on a, on a positive trajectory uh, up. I don't think, you know, I'm not going to suggest what the, what the arc of that trajectory is, but I think the general trend is certainly uh, in the right direction on, on a range of all the, on, on all the key issues. Um, so whether it's, I mean, it's interesting that you uh, talked about, in particular, the kind of selective prioritization, because obviously this is an issue that gets at the heart of kind of our bilateral conversation. So we have to rely on um, what is being prioritized for us by our interlocutors on the Pakistan side, but certainly something that Ambassador Munter dealt with while he was out there and, and in many of the conversations with the uh, former foreign minister, finance minister, and others. Uh, the fact that we uh, sought to not only focus on these key priority sectors, energy, economic trade, a kind of range of others, but on Pakistani implementers to get away from kind of the typical beltway bandits to try to build uh, broader capacity there with the amount of oversight, um, which, uh, sorry, w with the amount of oversight, uh, which we're obviously required uh, to use and uh, which is necessary uh, for us. But that, um, that we tried to marry that up uh, as best as possible with, I think, some real tangible results. I mean, the, the business investors conferences uh, that we sought to do, the, the fact that uh, we didn't have an enterprise fund available, and so we created this PPII uh, from scratch. The fact that not only uh, in our assistance, but that we were able to vote for DASU and a range of other things, despite uh, our climate action uh, plan and, and, um, uh, and you know, the fact that Congress uh, doesn't like big hydro projects at this point uh, and all the various constraints that we are up against, I think has is, is been quite important. But most importantly um, will be the continued uh, CT relationship, particularly for Congress. And so, you know, look, this is a, this is a, it's a, it's a public setting. It's public remarks. It doesn't mean that we're not clear eyed about um, private conversations that we have as well, but I think it's a, um, it's, 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 quite um, uh, a testament to the relationship that we have, I think, hard but increasingly honest um, uh, conversations uh, in private, um, but that there's increasingly a sense of convergence in those, in those conversations. Um, so, you know, we, we deal with the whole gamut of, of very difficult uh, discussions, but, um, but ones that, uh, that we both are committed to um, kind of a, a real honesty uh, in those uh, through multiple channels um, and which have borne some real fruit. So, I mean, in terms of the relationship with Congress, you know, you, again, you have to look at it compared to all the other constraints that are put on, that are, that are put on funding. I mean, not, first of all, starting with 
our own domestic financial constraints, uh, the fact of kind of what assistance, uh, the view of most Americans towards foreign assistance writ large, um, and, and then the whole range of other crises that are preoccupying uh, most parts of this government right now. And so to tell Congress, which has spent $13 billion on CSF funds over the last uh, 12 years, 13 years, uh, that they don't have a right to say there are going to be strings attached to this, and that the strings are not only in our interests, but in Pakistan's security interests, I, I think it's just not realistic. Um, and uh, they deserve those answers, and, uh, and that's why you're increasingly seeing um, uh, what the conditionality is in terms of if there's going to be this, this continued uh, CT relationship. But it's obviously a relationship that we uh, give high priority to, uh, that we um, that we want to see work. Uh, I think there's been a, there has been a real change uh, in Pakistan over over the years in terms of um, the uh, picking and choosing among extremists. Um, but it's a perception that Congress still very much has, and that they want to be reassured uh, that in their diminishing funds for this, that it's money well spent and for U.S. national security interests. So they they they, they have a right to hear that. Um, I'll leave the I'll leave the bit about the office to to, to, to my colleagues, but I, but I, I my my core belief is that um, this was a very innovative experiment and one that helped to marshal U.S. resources in a way that large bureaucracies find very difficult to be nimble, and that uh, at the end of the day. You know, I, I, I think that there are many, many reasons why uh, a relationship uh, could, go, could go sour uh, between the two key entities that have nothing to do with how others uh, define it or anything else. And for our purposes, uh, to be able uh, to act as uh, quickly and creatively um, and at the highest levels, uh, I think this has uh, borne great dividends to the people of Pakistan. Uh, see, I would simply add that, you know, in response to General Ghazi and General Asif Yassin's uh, remarks, that I am not at all suggesting that everything is hunky-dory between Pakistan and the U.S. What I was suggesting is, was that things are certainly on a much better course today as was the case yesterday. You know, you also need to understand that in the last several years, and as uh, Dan rightly mentioned in his, uh, in his statement, that Pakistan, relations with Pakistan were also being th seen through the lens of Afghanistan, which also created a lot of complications. And here, I think the uh, remarks made by, observation made by Dr. Ishrat Hussain is very apt, because that certainly uh, uh, did not, uh, nobody in Pakistan felt comfortable with this, uh, this uh, Pakistan bracketing with Afghanistan, or for that matter, any country, Pakistan should have been dealt with in its own right and in, in its own merit. But having said that, I think uh, uh, what we are witnessing, witnessing today is, you know, as was, you know, contrary to the past, when uh, all the briefings and testimonies before the members of the Congress, they were all entirely on a negative line today. Uh, we uh, we will witness it on a daily basis, whether it is uh, the ASRAP office, whether it is the Secretary <laughs> Kerry, his briefing to the members of the Congress, whether it is uh, Secretary Hegel or uh, Director CIA or uh, the Defense Authorities, they're all on a positive line. And the direction that uh, they have taken, I think that this is something that is going to have a much better impact on the sustainability of this process uh, that we, we are talking about. Uh, there are uh, going to be challenges, uh, but uh, what is more important uh, for somebody like me, who, is a, who has been a practitioner of this relationship, is that uh, the, uh, the, there are uh, much better engagement today. The uh, degree of engagement is much better today. Uh, at, at all level, whether it is from think tank to think tank level, whether at the official level or whether it is the, at the political level. Things are certainly looking up. And I would say that this relationship uh, may not be, uh, have reached an ideal stage, but certainly we are better today than was the case yesterday. And I have absolutely no doubt that in case we maintain this trajectory uh, tomorrow, certainly it is going to be even better. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Jelani and uh, Ambassador Feldman. Uh, I'm going to ask Mark and uh, Jim if they want to respond to that last question from 
Vishrat, before we uh, conclude this session. Um, I'm glad to. Thank you very much. I think it's a, it's a fair question. I'd start where Dan Feldman ended. I, I know this is a conversation about Pakistanis and Americans, but uh, the creation of the office in 2009 of the uh, Special Representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan was, as Dan said, about us and not so much about you. Um, it was a way to <clears throat> bring the resources of the United States government together in one place in an experimental way. And when you look back at the statements that were made in 2009 by both President Obama and Secretary Clinton, they were trying to send a message, yes, to South Asia, but they were also trying to send a message to our own government that there was a new way of doing business and called the whole of government way of doing business to bring people together in one place to do one job to pursue one mission. And I think that that was a worthwhile thing to try to do. And I say that has a lot more to do way we were organized than perhaps the substance of something that had to do with the United States and Pakistan. Second, and I think the generals will, I hope, bear me out here, you go back again, it shouldn't be surprising that there was a huge focus on Afghanistan when we had 100,000 young men and women in Afghanistan. And so uh, I think the fact that people focused on this, and I went to plenty of meetings uh, at the White House and at the State Department where it was really important to get that piece right because we had such a huge um, commitment there. I would say, sir, that come 2011, and here is the place perhaps where I know it best because that's when I picked up, uh, Secretary Clinton, in carrying out the president's policy, and certainly in a speech to the Asia Society in New York in February of 2011, I think made the kind of pivot or rebalance or whatever the right word is uh, that you were talking about, which is to say that her speech at that time opened the door to a larger consideration about the importance of Pakistan. And as you rec recall from that speech, she said, let's move away from just this focus on Afghanistan. Let's realize, first of all, that this is a regional question, that it, Pakistan has a very important role to play in the future. And for goodness sakes, let's see if it were possible for Afghans to talk to other Afghans about the future of Afghanistan. So I would submit to you, sir, that at that time there was a recognition of your point, <coughs> that there was a regional perspective brought into uh, this area, even though the Special Representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan didn't change bureaucratically. I, I look back and I know that the foreign, former foreign minister said we shouldn't kind of take on our former roles, so I'll try not to do so. But I, I, I think if you, if you look back, and I say to myself, you know, were, were we even partially successful in bringing the regional perspective? I think that that is what the big meetings in Istanbul about the region, the heart of Asia, with Pakistan as a part, uh, in Bonn, and I know that uh, the foreign, foreign minister was not able to come to that meeting, but it was about the future of the region, <coughs> Chicago, Tokyo, all about the future uh, of the region. And also, I think, as Ambassador Jelani will um, recall, even at the worst parts of the relationship between Pakistan and the United States in 2011, uh, we were working through this core group uh, to try to make sure that Pakistan played an important role in the conversation among Afghans with other Afghans about the future of Afghanistan. So uh, I think the idea, the headline, if you will, a secure, stable Afghanistan, a secure, stable, prosperous Afghanistan inside of a secure, stable, prosperous region meant that certainly for the period where I was, I had the, good, had the honor to have this responsibility, we were attempting to move the focus from just AFPAC to a larger regional context. And not only history will judge, but I think it was a step in the right direction. Thank you. Jim? Well, I'm, I'm attracted to the idea that the quality of uh, U.S.-Pakistani relations is largely a product of the SRAP. That would mean that Mark was responsible for the decline in relations <laughs> and, that, and that I've been responsible for the improvement. Um, uh, however, to be fair, I think that there were objective circumstances in each case which had nothing to do with the existence or non-existence of this particular office. Uh, during the period that Mark was dealing with it, you had the Ray Davis affair, um, you had the uh, conflict along the border, which killed dozens of Pakistani troops. Um, you had drone strikes. Uh, you had the Abbottabad raid, um, all of which inflamed uh, Pakistani opinion. Uh, and on the American side, you had uh, the fact that bin Laden had been living quietly in, in Pakistan for years. 
um, and that the Taliban was continued to operate unimpeded from Pakistan into Afghanistan, killing um, uh, at that point over 2,000 American soldiers. Um, uh, so there were objective circumstances. And while I'd like to take credit for uh, the improvement that occurred during my time in office, I think it had a lot more to do with the uh, coming into office of a new uh, Pakistani government, a new prime minister, and a government that committed itself to not allowing Pakistani territory to be used uh, to destabilize or attack any of its neighbors, uh, and to steps that began to be taken in that regard, including most recently the operation in North Waziristan. Now that commitment hasn't been fully uh, met. There's going to be a lot more that's going to have to be done. But I think Americans believe the, re the relationship is now moving in the right direction, and they're prepared to give it time to continue in that respect. Thank you very much. Um, you've been such a, a wonderful group that uh, I think we're going to give you uh, a 10-minute break to get a cup of <laughs> coffee and to come back as we rearrange the, the name tags here. But uh, please join me in thanking uh, Ambassador Daniel Feldman and Ambassador Jalil Abbas Jalani. <laughs>